hustling by doing the only thing I knew how to do. Doors opened for me that I couldn't have otherwise imagined. While other people are focused on impressing each other, people like me are winning on LinkedIn. Why? Because it's all about connecting. I couldn't breathe if I wasn't an entrepreneur. Welcome to the Startup Gambit, presented by Haste and Hustle. I'm Shauna Arnett, founder and CEO of Haste and Hustle. And I'm Devon Codrington, COO of Haste and Hustle. Today's guest is Nesh Pillay, founder of Press Pillay, an East Coast-based digital communications agency with an emphasis on social good. Welcome, 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 everyone. Nesh, nice to meet you, finally. Yeah. Shauna, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. It's a beautiful day here on Vancouver Island. I know you guys are both back in uh, Ontario. Is yeah, we're having a bit of a heat wave. It's warm, yeah. but I'm not complaining. I'll take yeah. what I get. I know. It's I'm hard. okay. It reminds me of Singapore. Literally, I was like, I went, went outside and I was like, this is this is what it was like. Yeah, I'm okay. <laughs> oh, man. With it. When I was in Singapore, I was it was so hot all the time, just super hot. I've anyway. never been to Singapore, but it gives me South Africa vibes. If that's oh it. yeah, there you go, there you go. When I was in South Africa, it was February, so it wasn't too, too hot. Which so. part were you in, though? Were you in Joburg? Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah it's cold and, in Joburg. It gets really cold. Yeah, and then we were up in Nelspruit. Mm. So, beautiful spot. All right, well, uh, we're going to just take a quick moment to hear a word from our sponsors, and then we're going to get going. What if I'm not ready? What if I don't have all the answers? What if I just keep going? What if it doesn't go as expected? What if this setback helps me see the bigger picture? What if I realize how far I've come? What if I remember I'm doing the best I can with what I've got? Today. 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 I'm ready for what if. Get ready for what if. Meridian, where banking feels good. Welcome back. Welcome to the podcast, everyone. Thank you so much for being here, Nash. Devon, it's always great to see your face. I know we talk <laughs> every day, but uh, you're one of my favorite people. So um, hence why we do this podcast together. And uh, so, yeah, I'm really excited to have you here, Nash, because, you know, we've known each other for a few years now, and you've been such a supporter and um, just a great advocate for me. And I really appreciate all the ways that you've um, just been in our, in my business and in my life. And so, and I've always been so impressed by the work that you've done and the work that you're doing. And I think you have so much to offer um, as a voice to our community and all those that you come into contact with. So this is a great opportunity for us to share you a little bit with our community. And uh, so, yeah, so take a few minutes and just tell everyone who you are, what you've done. Yeah, and, uh, I mean, I'm yeah. honored to be here, first of all. Same, I have all the nice things to say about you too, Shauna. So that's <laughs> one of the biggest reasons I'm happy to be here in Devon. Um, yeah, my background actually started in journalism. So I did not start with marketing or entrepreneurship in mind, didn't consider it as a possibility, really. Um, and through journalism, I covered things like human interest, but I ended up um, in a role in New York where I was covering the marketing and advertising industries. Um, and it's then that I realized it was just really, really seedy kind of. So being South African born, um, you know, seeing people in ext with extreme income inequality and things like that, seeing the amount of money that was going into these campaigns that would then be funneled into, you know, wine nights and continuous parties and there's glitz and glamour. It's not unlike Mad Men, actually. It's not terribly different from that still. Um, and so for myself, I wanted to kind of do better at this, you know, so I, I, I spent some time um, doing the grunt work required to understand the industry. So uh, leading up a couple startups, helping a couple go public. Um, I also have some, some major crisis communication background without saying the name, I would say uh, I've, I've worked on some of the greatest or largest data breaches that in history in, in Canada as well. Um, and so all of those things kind of just, it was just crash, crash course after crash course in marketing um, and PR. Uh, and that sort of led me to opening my own agency, you know, an agency that's done in the way I would have liked to see all the other, other agencies. We redistribute funds, we work with nonprofits, um, really try to put the heart back into marketing. Awesome. Well, it's obvious for, for, it was obvious for me when I met you and it's still obvious knowing you that that's how you operate. So it's great to hear it from you. 
So yeah, so that's that's a, a pretty remarkable uh, pass so far, and I know that you have great things coming up too. So we'll just get right into it um, with our questions, and then um, over the course we'll we'll talk a little bit about uh, where you're going and and some of the things you have coming up. So um, just to start, we like to get you know this is called the startup gambit, so we like to get really tactical and and have some of those questions right up front, and also just get into some conversation as well. So. Um, my first question is, um, if you were, uh, you know, just starting a business, what are the essential base strategies that early stage businesses can employ um, just to start like building a critical mass for good PR right off the bat? Absolutely. I think at the very beginning, it's just understanding because like an overwhelming number of early stage uh, founders I speak to hate PR when they've tried it, you know, because for an early stage founder, PR is very, very expensive. And I think the expectations and the understanding of um, what it actually means is just not always there. So, um, you know, the one thing is everyone kind of has a friend who was just featured in Forbes or in this or that or HuffPost. And you're like, wow, I want that. I want to see my name in those lights. And that's really great. But you also have to ask yourself why. Um, because often, again, working with an agency to get to that point, it's really building a reputation. So, you know, Shauna, for example, we've known each other a few years now. I must have heard your name tossed around by people I trust three, four times before we actually sat with each other and vice versa. It's a reputation takes a long time to build. Um, and think about yourself as well. If you're reading an article and a brand happens to be mentioned, you'd be like, oh, that's kind of cool it's unlikely that you're reaching into your wallet to go and buy a product from that brand. So setting those expectations where PR is not a converter, um, it's mm -hmm. very much to just build a reputation and that takes time, that takes groundwork. Early stage founders often don't have that. They often do have to rely on other quicker convert marketing strategies. That said, you also don't want to be, I've seen a few organizations that focus so hard on their product and perfecting it um, that when it comes down to it, nobody knows them. And then that works, that doesn't work in their favor either, right? Okay. Um, so for early stage founders, I think really, really just being educated, um, advocating for yourself, sort of um, making friends in the journalist world and also recognizing that um, like don't let the FOMO get you if you're not in Forbes it's fine Forbes doesn't necessarily convert so just sort of pace yourself you don't have to put you know 30 percent of your first raise towards PR I think that's going to overextend you and it's going to make you hate it yeah yeah that's great advice. great advice I like how you touched on like you know some of the founders being mentioned in Forbes and whatnot, I think there's so much of that, like that glamorizing of the founder being pushed out there everywhere. And I think that a lot of founders and they, and even like people that just have an idea that aren't at, at any stage yet are just thinking, this is what it means to be an entrepreneur, you know? And, and I wonder like how much people are focused on the work or as, as opposed to being like recognized just because they founded something as opposed to what they're going to do and who they really are. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I get the sense that a lot of people don't have the distinction between marketing and PR and you've touched on it a, a bit, but like, how can you define that for our listeners specifically? What's the difference between marketing and PR? Like what's the structure that you kind of explain to someone? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, if we're looking at it from a very, from a technical perspective, if I'm designing a campaign, if that's the sound you hear, it might be my dog vomiting. I'm so sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I turned my phone off, but I couldn't turn that off. That's so, okay. you, is, is, are they okay? Like, do you, do you need to take a minute? She's like, okay. She's old. She just likes to gag. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, I apologize. So um, the way I would look at any sort of campaign, if we're doing a larger thing or just a go-to-market strategy, a product launch, is it's really broken into three key parts. So you've got your awareness, your consideration, mm. and your conversion all your marketing activities will fit into one of those three buckets, right? Um, PR is rarely, um, sometimes it's consideration where it's sort of someone seeing you for a second or third time. Often it's awareness though, that's upfront. Mm -hmm. But if you're, if you're, if PR is working alone, so say you're launching a product and you're only investing in PR, you're going to be disappointed. I see this time and time again, um, because there's no conversion piece. So what you really need okay. to do is be thinking about that audience journey. So, okay, let's say Fred X hears about us on breakfast television. 
and he happens to Google us, he goes to our website, then what is he seeing that's that's moving his mind along to push him to purchase the product for conversion? Can we then offer FredX? Can we, you know, um, can we then retarget Fred X with a 25% discount so that he's actually converting? That's really what that audience journey looks like. And it's important to recognize that PR is at the top piece of that. Now, you know, campaigns aside, PR is great for like just that ongoing brand building. Um, but yeah, again, it's not, it's not great for conversion. That's awesome. That's uh, actually, I think that's a big, a big distinction that a lot of people probably did not even know about, you know, that that conversion isn't the key piece there. Yeah, absolutely. It is. And, and, and um, yeah, I think that, you know, with larger organizations, it's not that much of an issue because they've got departments for everything. They've got an agency for each piece of the funnel. Um, and so PR naturally works with all of those other pieces. If you're an early stage founder, you're shoestring. Um, right. I wouldn't necessarily recommend spending all of that budget on PR up front. I would learn sort of grassroots tips and tricks to kind of get yourself out there, make friends with reporters, try to get your story picked up. Um, the other thing that I kind of mention a lot is um, PR is often synonymous with press releases. Um, and I just, I keep telling people to just let press releases go. I mean, investors love to see press releases. So that's one thing. It's gr they're great for SEO if you're putting them on the wire. But if you're, you know, a good wire will cost you a few thousand dollars. Um, it's, it's not going to, con it's not going to, journalists are rarely sort of trolling wires for news. I was a journalist. We never did that. I think maybe for Apple, I did that once. Right. So I was um, just going to ask like, who's reading them is literally like, that was the it's, next no, it's, it's kind of like just the circle, like add a boy that we have going <laughs> to the money to put it on a wire. And so, you know, these organizations, these news organizations that will just aggregate from the wire will do that but there's no actual story written about you. And then you get more SEO because of that, but it's not actually, or your SEO improved, sorry, but it's not actually doing a whole lot of anything. We're just kind of creating this illusion for ourselves that we're mm. doing great marketing because we're really insecure because marketing can be like a weirdly vulnerable thing. Yeah, I think that's so interesting because I've you know spent five years building this business and I think we've put out maybe three or four press releases, you know, it's not been a lot of them, but the, the greatest impact that we've had is just going out and building the reputation in person. So for me, it was a lot of networking right up front and, and that can be your greatest PR at, at first. Right. And it doesn't really cost you anything. You know, you go maybe 10, $15 to go to a networking event or whatever, a glass of wine or something, which is a benefit. And, uh, you know, you go out to all these, you know, so some of that, some of that I think is right off the bat can be, you know, your simplest way of building a reputation, getting out there, getting to know people, going to meetings, having dinners, and then, and then, you know, following it up. And, and, and I like that customer journey situation that you mentioned. So where they're then, you know, seeing you out, they're seeing you online, they're seeing your website and, and there is some kind of, you know, backup. I, I go through so many, um, LinkedIn profiles when I'm doing reach outs and whatnot and you see the LinkedIn and then you see the website and there's no connection mm -hmm. and it's like I just cross those out I don't even go to them and uh, so I think that can be where, right where it starts as simple as that it doesn't always have to be a you know new story and I also think like the challenge is you're also working against people who are just throwing money at these things so a lot of these stories that are written on entrepreneurs they're paid for you know, the, you know, I, I get requested all the time. Oh, you want to be in Forbes? You want to be on the cover of whatever? And it's like, you just pay us this $10,000 or whatever. And it's like, that seems so inauthentic to me. It and, is. and I've called them out on it, you know, and I, and, and it's funny. I remember recognizing it a couple of years ago when I saw this entrepreneur magazine, like that, that magazine, and they had a list of like top, um, uh, generation Z um, entrepreneurs, you know, making, breaking ground or something. And I looked at it and I'm like, I know all those young <laughs> people and I know they're all friends. And I'm like, who's writing the article? Oh, the guy I know. Like, I'm like, <laughs> okay. So it's like a, it's a cool kids club out there. It, it and, uh, yeah. Yeah. And I thought it was a little bit funny. So I, I recognize like, you have to also recognize I know it's a little bit of smoke and mirrors and people get impressed by that. And it's, and, and you know, so that is part of the game, but at the same time, I think the, the greatest value can also be 
and maybe I'm speaking out of turn. You can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the greatest game is just presenting yourself well also um, on social, on your website, on, on different things in person and, and building it up from there. And then start to, as you say, get to know the journalists, get to know the people and come up with yeah. those really good stories with them. So, well, anyway. listen, yeah, absolutely. If you're pitching to a journalist, there's this a little secret that I use that I call, I coined it the grapevine method. Mm -hmm. um, so here's the difference between like a bad pitch and a good pitch, having been a journalist. Um, so most organizations and especially young entrepreneurs were so excited, I'm so mm -hmm. sorry. <laughs> we're so excited about what it is that we're doing, right? It is our whole world. And we forget that it's nobody else's whole world. So I've had to say to some founders, like, you know what, like, even your mom isn't as interested in this as you are, you know, because you assume that the whole world <laughs> wants your story. They, you know, of course, no one's done this before. No one's done this like this. Well, this backpack is different from this backpack because it's got a strap here. It's so interesting. And it's really not. Um, and so I think the best way to pitch a story if you are going to reach out to a journalist is to look at the existing news cycle. So the grapevine method is this, say your news, a new launch, a new product, whatever, a new initiative is the grapes. Um, the existing news cycle is the grapevine. So that can change at the drop of a hat. For much of the last two years, it's been COVID related, you know, changing workforce, those kinds of things. Pay attention to what it is that people are writing about and what it is that people are reading about and recognize it changes almost by the day. So if you see a good pitch, you have to do it right away. But the most important part of that is that STEM. What connects your news to what's going on in the actual world? You, if, if, you, if you can pitch with that STEM, so if you can say, so rather than saying, you know, um, I'm opening a store in Toronto. Um, nobody knows who you are. Nobody cares that you're opening a store. I'm sorry. Um, however, if you're saying, if you're looking at the news and you're seeing, you know what, there's a lot of news about um, storefronts that had to close down in Toronto due to COVID. Um, and also there's news around um, BIPOC women. I can then say, you know, in light of 34% of storefronts on this street closing in this pa in the past year, um, I, a BIPOC woman, am opening a store, I will be one of only three BIPOC women on the street. Suddenly it's news. Suddenly it's interesting. Um, my line is existing isn't news. That's really what it is. So remind yourself, it's a big ego check, you know, to yeah. realize that just doing something isn't news, but it helps. I know. I think I realized that pretty early on when I thought, you know, I was having this conference, I had Gary Vee coming and I'm like, well, that's news. Like everyone's going to want to know. It's going to be everywhere. <laughs> well, it was nowhere. But anyway, <laughs> I learned. <laughs> that's no, good. Trust me, if you're not, the quicker you learn that, the better and the, yeah. the more you can like find relevancy. Exactly. I really like that grapevine method. I think that's so, so well put together um, and, and relevant. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I know you and I were talking the other day a little bit about, um, you know, crisis communications and, you know, we've, we've kind of experienced this world this past year where there's just so much anger and frustration and different, you know, negative emotions on the internet and online. And I think, you know, people are getting attacked and, you know, for sometimes very innocuous things. And, and I'm wondering, and I, so I know you and I were talking about the other day, like how to be more proactive in your marketing and so that you don't have to be reactive um, and, and why that's important. So I know I'd love to just get you chatting a little bit about that because I think our conversation the other day was so interesting to me. Yeah, absolutely. I've had a lot of brands come to me in the past year. Some of them significantly large brands um, that will get, that will have someone reach out on social and say, you know, oh, you have this post about Black History Month. How many Black employees do you have? Or, you know, International Women's Day. Like, really, I noticed you have 20% women working at your company. And people are being called out in this way. Consumers now more than ever expect their brand's values, the brands that they follow to mirror their goods. People will play, pay a premium for a brand whose values mirrors their own. So it's a, it's a very interesting time um, in that regard. And with social media, everyone has a voice and everyone has direct contact and direct access to their brands. Um, so the first thing is to just have a plan 
same kind of thing. A lot of these brands are being reactive in their work um, on this front, but it's almost it's almost too obvious that they should be proactive. For example, again, an organization, you know, jumping on, jumping on, but a lot of them frankly have uh, the Black Lives Matter thing, right? I've had a lot of founders be like, I don't know what to do. I don't want to say something. I don't want to say nothing. I don't want to say too much. I don't want to say too little. Um, but they've never had a Black employee. They have no history of doing anything for the Black community. Um, their customer base is primarily white. And so it's inauthentic and audiences can see that. In fact, audiences now are not cannot just spot that, they're looking for that. They're looking, it's, it's the time of yeah. cancel culture, right? Yeah. Um, so what we wanna be doing is planning for it. I can tell you there's going to be another Me Too type movement. There will be another Black Lives Matter type movement. There will be a former employee that puts a review out about how your place is the worst place to work. There will be a former client that puts a bad, horrible review out. Just recognize that these things are more likely to happen than not happen, um, and then start to plan for them. And we can talk about some of the strategies that you can use. Hmm. So actually, now that you say that, I was thinking about that. I was thinking about if you're creating a, a PR structure um, and seeing how that links with links to marketing and whatnot, does the global issues that are happening that some of the ones you just addressed, which is the ones we might as well talk about considering like how life has been for the past two years, right? Were you considering that? I mean, you, but I mean, other under PR people as well. Should we be considering that going forward as this is the new norm? And if so, how, because I mean, if you're an early stage entrepreneur, it seems like that you have to have a holistic approach to everything. There's this PR, but like, like we're, we might not necessarily be in Forbes or whatnot. So like, what are the ways that an, an early stage entrepreneur puts themselves out there? Is it social? Is it their blog post? Is it, you know what I mean? Is it just being on Twitter? And as they're doing this to build their own identity, their own, you know, reputation, how 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 should they best kind of consider that? Should should they be hiring someone like? And of course, you have to leverage all of that with with bootstrapping it. I know I kind of asked you a lot of different things there. I guess in no. a nutshell, what do you do? What do you do to have your comms consider the world as it is now and the fact that this is coming again? Yeah, I mean, having a comms plan uh, it sort of goes alongside marketing. I kind of do hate how certain brands, though, are using social issues for their marketing. It's icky to me. Oh, yeah, very much so. Terrible. Exactly. So I think that we're jumping on inequality and tragedies and, you know, trying to make ourselves look good. What really helps, so be authentic, right? So we recognize that these are issues. We recognize there are these key areas in our society where there may be, there's more inequality than other areas. What can we do? You don't have to be doing a lot as a brand. Even as an individual, if you're like, you know what, I'm gonna take aside an hour a month to mentor someone from this community. I'm gonna do this to learn. I'm gonna educate. Um, I think that you you kind of hit the nail on the head where smaller, you know, newer entrepreneurs can go onto their socials, can um, blog about it, whatever it is. But the one thing that people forget is it's okay to say, I don't know any better right now. It's more authentic to go onto your Twitter and say, I'm seeing this, here's how I'm feeling, but I also know I'm not the person to comment on it. I think that here's how I can do better. And that's all it is. You don't, a lot, I've seen a lot of people feel pressure in these times to like feel and to pretend that they've done more. And that is even worse. I think that some of the most authentic, um, best responses to these situations I've seen have been the people who say, here's what I don't know. And I realize I don't know it. I'm being vulnerable. I'm telling you, I don't know it. And I'm telling you, I'm going to do better. Yeah. And then actually do better. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's responsible. That's yeah, that's, that's responsible. Do you find that? Um, I mean, and this is me speaking from my personal experience, like, in the past year and a half, however long it's been, I don't know, time seems to be a little bit all over the place, right? <laughs> there are people now that are trying to capitalize on the fact that they know me and I'm a black man of color there. So it's like, in your advisory, are you finding people are like, what do I do? And then trying to cross the barrier in, in like how you 
how you deal with things being a woman of color do you, are you finding that because personally i'm finding that i'm i'm thrust into conversations that i don't want to have um regardless of what i'm doing i'm working on something very basic photography like video anything and then all of a sudden like, look at this black photographer yeah and it's just like hey you're a black man i know you're just here to take photos what do you think about this? Like, and I was like, this is beyond, like, I'm a photographer here today. Um, and I mean, I know this is a little bit off script, but I mean, no, like, Devon, are you finding any sort of a crossover with, yes. with, with that? So here's what I've found a lot is people will sometimes now give me a seat at the table that they would not have otherwise. Yeah. They won't actually listen to what I say. They okay. will give me a seat at the table so that they can say, look at this brown woman, mother, single mother on the table here. Look, look how great we are. So again, they're doing it for themselves. Mm. Um, what people don't understand is it's a lot of work to have to take on to be the educator. I've had, I oh. had an instance, right? I had an instance yeah. last week where, you know, it's, this is totally off script and I apologize, but um, I went to a store and there was some, someone was, did something that was clearly a little racist, right? And everyone um, who I told about it was like, what did you say? Did you tell her? Did you, this? and I was like, no, I was jewelry shopping. I don't want to educate this woman right now. That's not my job. Um, and I think that's the key thing to recognize is that, you know, people of color don't exist in your life to educate you. I can understand how it can feel that way. There are resources, there are the internet, there are, you know, diversity and inclusion coaches. There are people who actually get paid to do these things, but it's actually a lot of work to not just be the token person. Um, and oftentimes, frankly, even if I know I've earned my seat at the table, um, I'm thought of as just the token person. And I, I don't like that. Um, but yeah, I think, I think the big thing is for people to recognize that like, we're just here doing our jobs. Yes, yeah. we have to be of color or, of you know, women or whatever it is. Um, and it's not our job to, to teach you and be okay with that. I think it sort of ties back into what you're saying earlier about being reactive, because I know even for myself this past year, I really just took a step back. because I was like, sort of what you're saying I don't really know how to respond and and I didn't want to see I, I didn't want to go to you know every person of color that I knew and be like tell me about this give me your experience I want because I knew I mean I was reading these posts you know saying it how explaining how much work it was and I was like okay there has to be a, a better way to go about this I'm going to try and figure it out but it becomes like I think so many people are just like well we just want to express our support and yeah that's that's a lovely sentiment but the problem is is that there's not really an address no one's really addressing the systemic problem that has rooted this you know outcome that's sort of happening right now and that will continue to happen if we don't go back and address it and so it's a lot of like band-aid um responses that you know like i say i think they they come from a place of you know people wanting to be supportive but not recognizing that that's actually not fully supportive that's just like a teeny teeny tiny piece of the puzzle and really there's so much more work that has to be done and it has to be like you say, the time has to be taken to educate yourself yeah. in a way that, you know, doesn't oppress people even more, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, um, and I think that that's a, a lesson that I think now people are starting to see, but it's, it becomes, and that's where we can start to be proactive, you know, like Pro, it's yeah. not just proactive in our marketing, it's proacting, proactive in our approach to, you know, living in this world with everyone else that we live with, you know? Yeah. I mean, I have taken, I have, I, I, I watched your approach over the past couple of years and there, there, I have just quietly watched people's approach. Um, and I had a lot of people ask me, you know, how they should handle this Nash. It's black lives matter. What do I do? I'm like, you're not a client. You're not paying me. Like, yeah, I'm yeah. Not, I'm spend yeah. Money on doing your comms for you. Um, but I also myself have taken Devon. I think you find this funny, a tongue in cheek approach. So if you go to my speaker website, um, it's like a picture of me. And then in quotes, it says, wow, what diversity your audience probably. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. I know. I love that. Nice. <laughs> yeah, that was really good. I know. Well, I mean, I think there has to be a lot more conversations about it. And I know it was interesting. I was having this conversation. I think this is where we were talking about it. I was talking to this man who's getting involved with Taste and Hustle and he runs a, an online 
education platform and they've been building out this program for executive leaders to to do exactly what i'm suggesting and are, are speaking about it and it's training people on the systemic problems and finding going really deep on it you know and it's a you know it's a long course and there's so many components to it and uh, and I think he's taken a very thoughtful approach to to building it and uh, working with all the right people on it, and uh, and I think that that's something that we really need to consider is how are we truly educating ourselves? Are we just going out and you know reading memes and and you know finding random information on the internet, or are we really going and doing the research that we need to do to 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 understand and therefore make those changes and then making those changes? Mm -hmm. And I think. I and I think I'll add one other thing. And I think the something that we have to consider is that um, we're talking about, we're now talking about uh, institution, institutionalized um, racism and whatnot that have been set up for a long time. Having a couple posts and consideration over a two or three month period is not going to do anything to dismantle things. Like this is the very beginning. It doesn't, yeah. you don't like, you don't, if you walk into the forest and someone's like, well, walk out, it's going to take a, as long to, you know what I mean? It takes a long time to get out, you know, it, uh, to, to change things. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a generational thing. So, you know, sometimes people are looking for, they're, they're trying to address this the way they can address another, another crisis. Maybe, well, it's like, okay, well maybe, and you probably could speak to this better Nash, like, well, we've got like a six month window after this. Maybe people will no, no longer be focused on this because, because it'll be Christmas and we'll be talking about something else. And it's like, you can't just, you know, throw something throw something out there for a, for a couple a month or so and then be like all right we're good we've addressed this and like mm -hmm. we'll move on it's it's it takes time exactly. exactly yeah what we're seeing right now is a lot of symptoms right like when you're sick say i have some kind of undiagnosed sickness i'm just going to have all of these weird symptoms that's what we're seeing when there's a spike in again black lives matter protests when there's another because there's always another me too thing that comes out like what what these things are indicative of are these really deeply rooted issues and i don't expect you know my favorite soft drink to post a black square and racism goes away. Like, I don't think anybody expects that. I think that um, the two things that organizations can, that are damaging really is A, just ignore it, pretend like nothing's happening. Um, and B, just pretend like you fixed it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, we sent this black kid to school, so it's all good, we've done our part. And then, you yeah. know, use that in your marketing yeah. for the next three years. That's not <laughs> right. really yeah. it. I know it's so it's so silly. I, it's uh, so uncomfortable to watch. It really is. Like if you yeah. want to know what a person of color thinks, like we watch these things, and you can see the token person of color in an ad campaign. You know who it is, and it's always so uncomfortable. It's yeah. very uncomfortable. Yeah, I I'm not even a person of color, and I get uncomfortable. <laughs> <with that. laughs> I'm like it's so obvious. <laughs> I'm transparent, by the way. <laughs> No, I like that. <laughs> um, I'd love to, um, I, I, you know, we've been seeing a lot of uh, different media, you know, targeting different individuals lately and, you know, this cancel culture scenario. And I think sometimes small businesses get targeted almost through, you know, they make, you know, they make foolish comments that may, may have been intended otherwise, and then they get targeted, you know, viciously by the public. So I think it's important to understand what to do when you're targeted, if you're targeted, and, uh, and just how to handle that type of communication. So I'm going to push back a little bit even on the language we use to describe something like that. Sure. The organization is not often being targeted as much as they're being called out. Yes, cal cancel mm -hmm. culture is this whole thing that's like a little a little much. Yeah. But as an individual, like if someone, if I truly don't feel like I'm racist, right? And mm -hmm. someone reacts to some policy, something that my agency has done and is like, oh, actually, um, this was actually racist of you. And my immediate thing is going to be, I'm not racist, F you, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, I'm, yeah. like I'm targeted. I've worked on this business, you know, broken my back. How dare you try to take my business away from me? And then immediately you're going to go on the defensive. That is the worst thing you could possibly do. The best thing you can do, just like if someone comes up to you in real life and says, hey, what you did or what you said was maybe not the best thing is take a deep breath, 
take a few days if you need to reach out to that person individually if you need to and like come to some sort of okay not everyone wants to do that and then put out a statement that says hey you know what we heard you we didn't realize we'll try to do better the the actual number of cases where there was nothing done wrong when a company or organization or an individual is targeted is actually very, very low. Most of the time, it's just a matter of someone needed needing to be a little more educated. Mm -hmm. um, it can be like a really huge scandal and it happens. It's so much better to just be like, oh, we messed up, didn't realize we're going to take a break from our social. We're going to redistribute our marketing funds towards something else or towards educating our team. We're going to take a little bit our bad. We're sorry. You're going to have that negative press, but that negative press is not going to continue mm -hmm. with some of the with with the major data breach I was a part of that then turned into a whole other thing because a lot of CD company secrets came out because what we did was we denied, we denied, denied, denied and pretended it was nothing. Journalists are smart. They're <laughs> internet sleuths. They're smart. They will find more and more and more and more. So if you're saying, no, we didn't do anything. We're great. We did nothing wrong. They're going to find more on you. And that's just going to be a much worse scenario. Whereas if you're like, oh, caught us. Yeah. You know, it's mm. better. Yeah. I appreciate that correction actually. And that, and you're, you're right. I think that's uh, important to note and, and, uh, and recognizing your and owning. And I think that's part of just good leadership, you know, when you can own your mistakes, because, you know, we're all going to do it. We're all going to make it's mistakes, hard. whether it's in communications or anything. And uh, yeah, it, it sucks. And it's, you know, it's no fun. And, but I mean, I think if we can all also approach it with a, um, a spirit of, you know, wanting to learn and wanting to grow and saying, okay, how can I, you know, make this better? And, uh, and you're right. I think that's what, that's the attitude and the mindset that will certainly impact your communications. Yeah. As much yeah. as we say it isn't, or we try for it not to be in entrepreneurship is inherently personal, uh, like, yeah. you know, for oh, entrepreneurs, sure. it's, we breathe and sleep our, our efforts and what it is we're working on. And, um, you know, we care about them like we care about our children. So when we do feel like that's attacked, even if it's warranted, that's very painful and we immediately want to protect that. Um, so it's, it's, there's a lot, it's almost like everyone needs to go to therapy, right? Like there's a lot of work that needs <laughs> to be done to sort of find that vulnerability when you do feel like something you care about so deeply is being attacked. Yeah, totally. We've been, we're giving up our, yeah, the entrepreneurship, if you have the day job, is that like five to nine grind. So like that is your life. It's uh, I mean, whatever you've built is your baby. So you protect it with such. Um, speaking of and continue on on being called out, is that the right term as, as opposed to being targeted or the yeah, language around that? Called being out. called out. Okay. Yeah, I like that. Um, thinking of this in a couple of different ways, I, I like, I really like what you said about um, if you saw someone in and this happened on the street, you would pause and take a deep breath. And I kind of thought like, I guess the digital equivalent equivalent of that is like waiting a second to respond. So if you're doing, if you get called out um, and I'm, and you, you know, you're like, okay, you've taken this deep breath. What's something you should totally not say in, in your response. And then also, I guess, secondary to this, Let's say this is about, this is a twofer. Let's say this is about maybe um, a service or a product that you that you provide and, and you have um, some negative reviews that get some sort of traction or see the light somewhere. How can you also, how, how also would you address that? So maybe kind of what should you not do for the being called out maybe on the social or whatnot? And then relating that to like something that you offer and there's negative review, how would you respond to that? Yeah, I mean, um... I think the first, again, is whatever your reaction is, your instinct on instinct, you want to say, write it down on a piece of paper, put it in a drawer. And just okay. that, yeah. right? so that's yeah. not going to be what you do or say. Um, like I said, sit on it for a little bit. You also don't want to sit on it for too long. If you find that you're sitting on it for too long, you know, after a week or so, you can say, hey, we see you, we hear you, we're coming, well, we're coming, you know, we're figuring okay. it out. Um, I do think that... Um, the worst thing you could do is um, gaslight the person. I've seen a lot oh, of people do wow. this is because um, that's what you're doing, right? If an, or, if, if an employee says, I had an awful time, I'm going to use Shauna here, sorry. I had an awful time working for Shauna um, because Shauna was X, Y, and Z and she did X, Y, and Z to me. But for Shauna, say Shauna was going through something in her personal life and she was doing the best she very she could. <clears throat> 
She thought she was doing great by this employee. She had no idea that this person was really unhappy. Um, and so Shauna goes on there and she's like, what are you talking about? Actually, I did this, this, and I got you a Christmas sweater. And, you know, so what are you <laughs> talking about? Um, that's very sort of troubling. And that's very dangerous is I think that maybe I'm naive. I don't know. But I, I don't think most individuals go out there trying to take down organizations and take down other people for no reason whatsoever. So I think the very first thing you need to do, no matter what, is acknowledge the experience of the other mm. person, whether you understand it, whether you agree with it, um, whether you think they're just trying to take you down, acknowledge their experience rather than run from it or deny it or try to prove otherwise. That's not necessary. I've seen some organizations be like, we're gonna bring the receipts and suddenly it's like this whole dramatic thing and it's unnecessary, you know, mm. just be a person, be cool, <laughs> it's fine. Yeah, yeah. Be a person. Be cool. That's cool. <laughs> yeah, I that's, like that. That's the name of the episode. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That's going to be your quote forever. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I think that's so important. I mean, we have to recognize that who we're dealing with are people ultimately, and um, when you can meet people in their, you know, in their hearts and where they're at, and and just be an active listener. Again, it turn sort of kind of comes back to just good leadership. So I like that example. All right. Well, we are sort of rounding out this interview. And uh, as much as I'm enjoying this, and I don't want it to end, we have uh, lots to do, and I'm sure you do too. So we have our signature questions that we love to ask everybody. Um, so I'm just going to ask you. Um, so if you were, oh, hold on, where are they? Okay. I always um, lose them. And then Scroll I, up. <laughs> okay. There we go. Okay. So, oh yeah, I don't know why I'm forgetting. It's because I'm sick. I'm going to blame it on that. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> um, if you were to have dinner with anybody, um, who would it be? Is and this why? dead or alive? Yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. I have the yeah. same answer to everyone. It's Nelson Mandela. So I'm oh, so- Oh yeah, bad. yeah. Right? I'm yeah. so bad again. Um, I feel, I mean- <sighs> I don't even get me started. There were riots in my country recently. Like the, yeah, yeah. we have a lot of systematic issues uh, and uh, a lot of like the uneasiness that's happening in South Africa now uh, was actually expected to happen when Mandela was released from jail and uh, apartheid ended, which happened in my lifetime. So it's, it wasn't that long ago, mm. um, but he came out of prison and he was like, listen, if we're going to ostracize all the white people, we're doing the same thing. So he convinced an entire nat nation to be empathetic for a little while. Mm -hmm. um, and I've, I've never heard of or seen another person who's done that, you know, in that way. So I think it would be with him. The other thing that's interesting uh, about him is I did a thing in college about how he was not a great dad. Um, oh, I did a speech about it. Like, you know, our heroes are not we put them on pedestals, but they're also not perfect people. Um, yes. But I do appreciate that. So I think it would definitely be Nelson Mandela because those are the kinds of things that I would, you know, I can't say that I fully live my life that way, but I really would like to. And um, I'd love to learn about his process. Yeah, no, amazing. Um, hand, hands down, good answer. Uh, not that there's any bad answer, but it makes it makes so much sense as you say. Yeah, it's it. the like, best answer, though, right? Like, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. If it was, yeah, I know, consider. I know it's not a contest, but if it was, <laughs> we'll give you a yeah. gold star. Don't worry. Thank you. Yeah. No one needs that affirmation, Shauna. <laughs> <laughs> I love okay. it. I, and um, I, I can reiterate that. I would love to have dinner with him as well. I think just the lessons, just the lessons. And, and I, I appreciate, you know, that empathy that he developed. I've read a lot of his stuff and, and followed his career and, and just been so inspired by him. We actually almost named our son Nelson after him. Really? Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, except um a friend of mine then reminded me that nelson was the bad character on the simpsons and I sort of <laughs> yeah. overtook it and, i thought that and i'm like is this <laughs> i know they were like ah, ah, and i was like oh, okay we're not yeah can't do that can't do that um do you remember he came to the the what was the sky dome like mm -hmm. and uh yeah i i was there as a little really? young devon was in the the really? audience he went to go to see nelson mandela in the sky dome which is yeah not what it's called i don't even know if i was in the country then or that, not. yeah probably not that would have been shoot i'm trying to think of the year late 90s yeah late yeah 90s. no i wasn't yeah. here but yeah no i'm yeah like, so we did come to like canada that. and and didn't address and we had written like essays and the people that 
did the best essays, got to go, and uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, that a little oratory, really? Devon. Yeah, 100%. It was great. That's amazing. I, I also did a project on South Africa, and I got like an A. It, okay, it wasn't an A. It wasn't an A plus. So I was like, I remember being mad, but I was like, you got an A. This is great, but push for the A plus. And I was like, okay, Dad, <laughs> Thanks, I will. Dad. Yeah, I know. I was like, you know, I'm going to go to Nelson Mandela. And he was like, okay, that's fine. It's fine. Go ahead. That's, go that's ahead, a pretty stop. awesome reward. Well, yeah. So. To jump back to some of the stuff we really are working on, it's a big lesson in how to deal with things not from your own ego and from hurt mm -hmm. and protecting yourself and like how to put your own anger on the back burner. Um, it's not it's it's not a human first instinct, right? I think it's oh, something no. we all strive towards. But I do think with things like conflict resolution, just in everyday life, really in things like crisis comms for your business, like if you can start to emulate those sorts of things, you'll find a huge, huge difference. Mm -hmm. And in leadership. Yeah, oh, for sure. I think it's such a huge, hugely important trait to have. Nice. More. Okay. Uh, if you, uh, sorry, Devon. If you oh no, I was just going to say more, ge more gems being dropped from Nashville. I know, so I'll I know. write that one down as well. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. If you weren't doing what you're doing now, what would you be doing? I would be doing what I'm doing now. Uh, well, <laughs> that's, that's the best answer. Thing. That's yeah. the best answer. That's, <laughs> I, that's my big thing that came out of COVID is I realized I've always been this person, like from the time I was five, right? I would run home every day because I had to get my spelling words right so I could get my sticker the next day. And in school, I was in all the clubs and I was the president of everything. And I edited the university yearbook myself. Like I was that kind of annoying kid, right? Mm -hmm. But um I kind of like never allowed myself to be happy where I was because it was always like, I'll be happy when I get mm -hmm. this next goal. I get to this great school. I get into this great program. I get a client. I get a bigger client. I do this. I do that. Um, and I, I, over COVID, I kind of stopped and, and, and wondered like, what are the attaboys for really? Mm -hmm. Like what is truly important to me? Um, and what is the value of those attaboys in my life? And um I realized that I want to be spending a life that does not revolve around my work. Like, I think my work should mirror my values and it does. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't want to work that much. I, I found myself during part of COVID, um, you know, again, continuing to chase the better title and the better this and the better that. Um, there was one day where my daughter just really wanted to hang out with me because schools were closed. She's like, mom and mom and mom. And she, she did this all day but I kept having to put her off like sorry sweetie sorry sweetie and I realized I wasn't living the life I wanted to live so the life I live is like I take care of my body I take care of my brain I eat good food I spend time with the people I love I just you know if I want to write a book I'm going to write a book and you know I recognize there's so much privilege in saying that I, I recognize that um, but I've definitely moved towards living the life that I want to live so I'm so happy you're there that's, yeah, that's awesome yeah that's the best answer i know that's okay that's you if you're not happy but i'm happy <laughs> <laughs> no i i makes me so happy that you're doing exactly what you want to do i feel the same way i i i'm completely thrilled with where things are at so notice yeah. all right nash <laughs> um final question um what is your overarching advice uh for um for entrepreneurs for founders it doesn't have to be related to pr it could be related to anything at all but uh mm -hmm. what's that one piece what's that one tidbit you'd like to provide um kind of ties into what i just said which is right yeah break up with hustle culture man like i really think about this now in that like at the very end of my life like i'm laying in a bed somewhere or whatever um, like there's no one that's going to be sitting there and like, you know, giving me an award for the most meetings or the most mm -hmm. family dinners missed or the most, you know, the least vacation time taken. There's no, there's no award at the end of your life for those things. Um, so I think that, you know, this concept of like the busier we are, the busier we seem, the more meetings we take, the more we take on our backs, like we, we kind of do that thinking that there's an award or a prize at the end of that. And we sometimes say that it's, um, you know, financial gain, but even at a certain point, the financial gain doesn't make too much of a difference in your life. So um, break up with hustle culture. Like you're not bad if you're spending less work doing things, mm -hmm. less time. You're not bad if you limit meeting hours. Like, love you, Shauna. I'm not going to talk to you again this week. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. It's all right. You're going on vacation. I get it. <laughs> I, <know. laughs> I broke up with hustle culture. It's great. 
I love it. I love it. And, you know, it's funny. People ask us a lot about our name because, you know, taste and hustle. It sounds like this, you know, really oh, intense. I, I forgot about that. That's no, okay. And it, no, it's okay. No, we strive for efficiency. You have to hustle at some point, but you, yeah, you, you want to balance. Balance is important. Yeah, because I'm very much about that. You know, like hustle when it's needed. But I, I completely agree with you. You have to have balance, and you have to, you know, be optimizing for the life that you want. And uh, and I think that's beautiful. So I'm glad you brought that up because I think it's important. So. Yeah, here I am on Hayes and Hustle's podcast, podcast saying break up with the hustle. <laughs> it's all right. Uh, we're for it's it. It's, fine. It's, it's, it's we, right. want, we, we want the authentic response more than anything, Nash. So Absolutely. It's, it's all good. Um, okay, so we are all out of time, and it's been awesome having you here, and I appreciate everything that you've shared with the audience. Um, where can people find you? Absolutely. So very easily, if you want to find me on LinkedIn, Nesh, N-E-S-H, Pillay, P-I-L-L-A-Y. Um, on Instagram, uh, I'm more fun on Instagram. It's Pillay.Nesh. Mm -hmm. um, or just uh, my ed my website, NeshPillay.com, or my agency's website, which is PressPillay.com. You can find me all sorts of ways. On amazing. The amazing. Well, we'll put that in our show notes and, and everything for people to see. And yeah, I, I'm really grateful for you being here. So thanks again. Oh, and thanks for everyone for tuning in and we'll see you next time.